on the air tonight with team coverage of a one, two, three punch of bad weather coast to coast. One, you've got the rain with one city bracing for another set of storms after breaking rain records already. Two, the heat with some of the hottest temperatures ever recorded. And three, there's that bad air quality one in five of us are dealing with right now. We've got live coverage from every angle. Plus, how did a little bag of cocaine end up in a really busy part of the White House? But the Secret Service is saying now about the investigation into whose it is. And new details about a potentially problematic confrontation in international waters. How the Navy managed to stop Iran from taking two of somebody else's ships. Plus, when is a tip a good tip? And when is a good tip not good enough? New details on a video gone viral of an angry door dasher and his customer, where that delivery driver is now and why so many people are talking about it. And a new conservative backlash brewing tonight, not against Bud Light this time, but against Ben and his friend Jerry. The meltdown over an ice cream controversy online and on the campaign trail later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight, just a day after the hottest day in modern history, tens of millions of us are in the path of extreme weather, from more record-breaking temperatures to bad storms to terrible air quality. You've got 29 million people looking at downpours, at really windy conditions, and look at this hail, maybe, in the Rockies and the Midwest, with Chicago set to take another beating after seeing record rain earlier this week. Look at what the storms left behind here. You're looking at it. You also have the sun beating down, breaking records records and forcing people to break a sweat for another 29 million folks. Another brutal day after what we saw July 4th, the hottest day since they started keeping track of this kind of thing 40 years ago, with experts saying it hasn't been this hot on this planet in 125,000 years. Gang, that's like caveman era stuff, right? I mean, this is historic. Tying it all together in maybe the worst way, one in five Americans are breathing in some really bad air right now because of dangerous ozone levels and those Canadian wildfires still burning. Here's a bunch of the cities where it's a problem, including right here in Washington. I want to bring in our team covering this, Shaq Brewster, who's live in Chicago for us, as well as meteorologist Bill Karens. And Shaq, let me start with you. Chicago, double whammy for you and folks there. It's not just the bad storms heading your way. It's also the air quality issue. Talk us through it. That's right, Hallie. I know right now it's pretty nice. It's pretty cool. You have the sun coming out right now, but forecasters say this is going to change very quickly, especially as we get into the evening hours. They're saying that we'll be under a thunderstorm uh, threat. And it's not just here in Chicago and not just here in the Midwest, but you have 29 million Americans. Actually, I think that's gone down. It's about 16 million Americans from the Midwest into Colorado facing this threat of severe weather. We're talking about heavy rains, lightning, even hail in some instances. That's on top of other people dealing with that severe uh, uh, temperatures, the high temperatures. You have plenty of cities breaking records today uh, as 29 million people are facing the high heat uh, conditions. And then, Hallie, there's the air quality, as you were talking about. About 62 million people are facing air quality alerts. Here in Chicago, it's uh, unhealthy air for people who are in sensitive populations, but you go to other places and that's where you get uh, worse conditions. So a range of conditions here, but right now I'm keeping my fingers crossed because it's still fairly good right now. There's also, so fairly good for now. Let's hope it stays that way. Of course, the concern is it's going to deteriorate fast. You've got wildfire season revving up as we talk about the concerns over air quality out west. We've got officials in Washington state trying to get a handle on one there. How are they doing? Yeah, I think we have some pictures of that wildfire there. It's only about 5% contained right now. We know that about 1,000 people have been displaced, but the conditions are not uh, really conducive to helping firefighters fight that. We know about 546 acres have been burned. Uh, that's destroyed some 10 buildings. So officials trying to get control of that. Again, the conditions are not helping them at this point, Hallie. Jack Brewster live for us in Chicago. Thank you. Let me bring in Bill Karens, our meteorologist now. So, um, Jack, in the line of some of those storms in Chicago, what else should people be looking for and where? Well, we've had numerous ground stops across the country. A lot of airports have had issues. Chicago O'Hare uh, through Orlando. We've had problems at many of the airports around St. Louis. And so here's Chicago doing one severe thunderstorm just to the south of you. A lot of thunderstorms out by Peoria and out towards Rockford. And again, we're not going to see a lot of widespread bad weather. We're not going to see a lot of tornadoes, isolated severe storms, and travel problems when these storms go through airports. And here's South Carolina, kind of a similar scenario. So the organized severe weather today, Chicago to Peoria, and then we're going to have 
developing storms this evening once again into Colorado, Amarillo, and areas of western Oklahoma. And then tomorrow, we're going to uh, once again, I mean, it's been a, just a miserable stretch of stormy weather here coming out of the Rockies into the Front Range. And that's going to be again the case tomorrow, maybe even a few tornadoes tomorrow, Hallie. What about these hot, hot, hot temperatures, right? I mean, July 4th, the hottest temperature on the planet that they've ever recorded, um, an average of about 63 degrees Fahrenheit, which sounds like rather comfortable, but the reality is that is well above where the average typically is, right? Well, you have to remember, that's the average for the entire globe. Right. So in the southern hemisphere, it's winter right now. And in the northern hemisphere, obviously, we're in the middle of our summer. So this is like, you know, this isn't the weather. This isn't what anyone feels. This is a whole planet thing. And let me show you some of the records that we've been setting as we've gone throughout the last month and the last, you know, last couple of weeks and stuff. We've been dealing with very warm conditions. So the big headline that you saw, first it was Monday. Monday they came out and they said it was the warmest day ever recorded. And when we say recorded, that goes back 83 years. So again, you know, it's only about from 1940 to current. The previous record was 2016. And here's the key, Hallie, during El Nino. And what are we in now? El Nino. So we're going to keep seeing all these records. And here's that temperature that we had today above the old record, which was 2016 in August. We still have another month. Hallie, we're going to see headlines. I bet you 20 to 30 times the, in addition, this next summer, you're going to hear we have just broken the record for the warmest day that we've ever had on this planet. We are warming the planet because of the wow. greenhouse gases and a strong El Nino is developing. These two things we've never seen. I can almost promise you, Hallie, that this year will go as the warmest or second warmest ever recorded. And I can almost guarantee you, I'd place a lot of money on it, that next year will be the hottest year ever recorded on this planet because of the strong El Nino. Bill Karen's uh, important context. Thank you for the predictions. We'll roll the tape in a year. Appreciate it, Bill. We'll see you next hour. People in Philadelphia in shock and in grief tonight, with police looking for a motive in the killing of five people Monday night, one of at least 17 mass shootings in this country over the holiday weekend, as many as 18 people dead. Now, the suspect in Philly is being held without bail after making his first appearance in court today. Here's how a local ER doctor is putting it. Well, it's really don't care. They don't care what faith you are, what party you belong to, they cause damage, not only to the victims, but to the families who we then have to go to talk to in the family rooms, and the wider community, as you saw, where the streets are now empty uh, because people are scared to go out in the street. Police say the 40-year-old suspect had an AR-style rifle and a ghost gun. Now, that's an untraceable gun that people can put together on their own, usually from parts that are sold online. Philadelphia's mayor, right as we were coming on the air, is announcing a new lawsuit to try to keep these ghost guns out of the city. Our Rahema Ellis has been covering the story and joins us now. Fill us in um, on what else we found out from the arraignment today, what else we know about the victims, and next steps here. What well, we found out about the suspect, a 40-year-old man who um, was on a closed circuit for the arraignment, was not present in the courtroom. He was appointed a public defender, and he's being held without bail. If he were able to post bond, if they made that available, we'd have to pay something like $7.5 million, and he doesn't have that kind of money, it does not seem. And uh, he's being held responsible for these five murders and for wounding several others. It's caused mayhem. It has caused desperation. It's caused despair in this community where five people were killed, ranging the age from a 15-year-old teenage boy to a 59-year-old man. The woman who is the mother of the 15-year-old, his name is Dewan Brown, she talked about he was just on his way to the corner store, and he saw a friend that he wanted to help because he seemed to be affected by the shots that were being fired. And Dewan lost his life as a result of it, and his mother is beside himself. There's also the sister of the first man we now know who was killed inside his apartment, unlike the other victims who were killed all outside on the street. She talks about her brother, 31-year-old Joseph Mawa, and her heart is broken. Listen. I don't understand how someone could just do that to my brother. Like, he... I really love him. There is pain all over this community. And it's the kind of pain that you can't repair. But the mayor is hoping it's the kind of pain they can somehow prevent from happening to other families. Hallie? 
Well, and that's part of this ghost gun lawsuit. Rahama, talk us through that, and then if you can, pull back, right, big picture, because it is not just the city of Philadelphia. There are cities across the country dealing with the epidemic of gun violence here. We talked about it, right? You're seeing Shreveport, Louisiana, here in D.C., Boston, Fort Worth, just some of the cities dealing with this as we've looked at, you know, a dozen and a half mass shootings over the 4th of July weekend. Yeah, one of the things that the mayor was saying, uh, not just today, but yesterday, he was talking about the fact that there are these weapons that come into the city, there's weapons that, are, that can be put together at home, and he said the community does not want this. And he says if we have elected officials who are not responding to the community, we need to change who are the elected officials to vote them out of office and put someone in. Listen to what the mayor is talking about in terms of these tragedies of facing his city of Philadelphia. As a city, we all have endured these tragedies together while investing hundreds of millions of dollars to address the problem. The root of the problem is the proliferation of guns in our city and in our country. Guns are the common denominator in every single shooting. We have heard it over and over again, Hallie, that guns are the common denominator. They don't manufacture any guns inside the city of Philadelphia and in this particular community. That's not where they make them. It's not like a bakery where you can go and get a bagel. You just right. don't go and get a gun. So he's saying somehow they've got to stop the flow of this. In the city of Philadelphia, they've already had something like 210, 219 homicides so far this year, not counting what happened in Philadelphia over this holiday weekend. It seems like uh, violence doesn't take a holiday in America anymore. That is for sure. Rahima Ellis, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Victims' families down in Texas face to face today with the attacker who killed the people they loved in one of the worst mass shootings in our country's history. At a Walmart in El Paso in 2019, 23 people died in all, with one man who lost his wife and daughter breaking down outside today's sentencing hearing. You sit there and you think, man, if, if, you, if you didn't do what you did, I'd, I'd have my child, you know, at home and hug with you. Incredibly difficult for so many people today with the shooter who admitted to targeting Hispanic shoppers at that Walmart, now facing multiple life sentences. Guad Venegas is covering this. He joins us now with more. Talk to us about what we've learned and what happens from here. Uh, Hallie, this is a federal courtroom, so no cameras are allowed inside, but our colleagues have been uh, inside that courtroom updating us. So this hearing began today with the judge uh, reading the names of all of those victims, uh, as well as those 90 uh, charges that uh, the shooter agreed and pled guilty to. This is part of a plea deal. Um, the prosecutors are looking for a life sentence for him. And it's been an emotional day for the members, the family members of a lot of these victims who, as we saw uh, in that interview with the media, the father of one of those victims spoke and cried. He also said uh, he wished that the shooter finds God and there's nothing else he uh, would say to him. Uh, when uh, the shooter came into the courtroom this morning, uh, you could hear uh, people crying, uh, sniffling as he walked into that courtroom and heard the names of those victims read by the judge. Now, the latest update that we have indicates that as of now, at least eight different family members have spoken. Uh, these are victim impact statements that are taking place during uh, this hearing that's expected to last a few days uh, before the judge hands down that sentence. So these are expected to uh, go throughout the day today and tomorrow and perhaps Friday, we would have this uh, sentencing. And now, Hallie, let's also keep in mind that this is part of the federal case against them. There's another case in state court, a state criminal case against the shooter. Now, in that case, he's facing capital murder uh, charges for multiple persons. And the district attorney's office in that case is asking for the death penalty. All of this, Hallie, happening nearly four years after the shooting took place. So it's going to be an emotional uh, month for the uh, family members of those victims. And then in August next month, it'll be four years since that shooting happened, Hallie. Guad Venegas, thank you very much for that. We have some new reporting just into us in the last couple of minutes about the new questions facing the White House today. How did cocaine end up in a pretty busy part of the West Wing? We're hearing in the last few minutes that this bag with the drug, it's like a little bag, it's like a dime-sized bag with the cocaine in it, is being tested at a federal lab. Uh, investigators are looking for DNA, they're looking for fingerprints to try to figure out who brought this in, according to an official familiar with the investigation. It comes as Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre has been just peppered with questions on this about security protocols and more. Listen. The Secret Service is investigating this, is investigating what happened over the weekend, and we have confidence that they will get to the bottom of this. 
Here's what else we're finding out today, that this formal lab test so far says that it came back, this little bag, positive for cocaine. Again, according to an official with knowledge of this investigation, it was found Sunday night in an area that a lot of people, including visitors, by the way, go in and out of, coming in and out of the White House. It could be hard for the Secret Service to figure out whose drugs it actually is. I want to bring in Mike Memoli. It feels like there's everybody's talking about this story because you don't often yeah. hear cocaine inside the West Wing, right? We know that, according to our colleague Kelly O'Donnell, officials are just telling her that they're looking at video surveillance, visitor logs, that may never be enough to connect the dots. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. I mean, these all speak to the Secret Service's investigation of what happened here. And what I find so interesting is that the White House has seemingly completely outsourced this investigation to the Secret Service. I was one of the reporters peppering Karine Jean-Pierre, as you say, <laughs> in that briefing about this uh, discovery. And one of the questions I asked was, you know, what is the nature of that investigation? Is this simply about finding out the facts of this matter, or is this go into potential criminally prosecution uh, of of the individual if they are able to determine it. But as Kelly O is reporting now, officials are sort of uh, cautioning that they may not be able to determine who this is if, for instance, the forensic data is not conclusive. They're also not clear still about when this baggie became uh, came into the White House. It was discovered Sunday night. There were private tours of the West Wing that were being given in the days leading up to it. But there's no assurance at this point that it was in those few days that this was discovered. If it was a longer period of time, it's going to be much harder even looking at the visitor log, all the security footage, all the forensic data to narrow the scope of who this might have been. If it was discovered as quickly as it was left there, then that's much more possible. But uh, it's interesting to me that at the White House, while seeming to deflect most of the questions to the Secret Service, is acknowledging a few things. One, making it clear again, the president, the first family, was not in the White House through the weekend. Two, that yes, White House officials are subject to rigorous drug testing in order to to remain employed there. The strong suggestion, though, in all the conversations that we're having, though, is that because of where this was found, an area where if you were going in as a visitor or as a guest for a tour where you might be asked to leave some of your personal items, the strong suggestion, and you can understand why the White House is suggesting this, is that it was an outside visitor and not necessarily a member of the White House staff. Right. Mike Memoli, uh, any idea in timeline, by the way? Like, when do we think we will know more, if ever? Well, it, of course, this could come to a head very quickly if they find that smoking gun. But the guidance we're getting from Kelly's reporting is that this could take weeks, not days. Mike Memoli, thank you much. Appreciate it. Take a look at some of the dramatic new video that we're seeing late today with a military official telling NBC News the Navy had to stop Iran from taking over two commercial tankers off the coast of Oman. So look at this. We're going to pull it up full for you here. You can see what appears to be one of the oil tankers getting shot at by the Iranians before U.S. ships came in and basically, like, flexed, right, to convince the Iranian ship to leave. Iranian TV says the government denies trying to seize the tankers, but this isn't some one-off thing. We've seen a bunch of confrontations between the Iranian Navy and merchant ships lately. Look at some of the reports about just some of them here. NBC's Courtney Kuby is covering this for us. A lot of incidents like this in the past few months. Why? What is Iran's endgame here? And what is the U.S.'s role in trying to stop this? Yeah, that's right. Upwards of 20 incidents that are similar to this in the last two years or so, Hallie, in case that means cases where Iranian Navy ships have either attacked or seized, tried to, or actually successfully seized commercial vessels. Now, what makes this one stand out a little bit more is the fact that one of the Iranian ships actually fired on one of those oil tankers, striking it several times. It hit an area where the crew tends to live and work, but no one was injured or killed in this case. But the ship did sustain some minor damage, according to U.S. military officials. But what the U.S. does in these cases, it really depends on an, 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 an each individual case. And we saw that play out exactly today. In the first one, the USS McFall, a U.S. Navy destroyer, and two U.S. overhead surveillance aircraft, a Reaper drone and a P-8 Poseidon, came on this scene and chased away this Iranian Navy vessel that was trying to get one of these tankers to sort of stop so they could presumably board and seize it. Well, the Iranian ship left. Well, fast forward three hours and to a very different scene where by the time the USS McFall answered the distress call of this other oil tanker, the Iranian ship had already fired on it. Similar to the first case, though, when the U.S. Navy ship arrived on scene, the Iranian ship left tally. Courtney Kuby, thank you for staying on top of this one for us. Appreciate it. Let's take you overseas now where militants from the Gaza Strip firing rockets into Israel today after just days of violence in that region. 
Israel in response hitting a weapons plant in this latest round of violence has been happening. Take a look at our NBC correspondents in the West Bank taking cover. This is part of our team we're going to show you here. You're going to see Israeli armored vehicles rolling by, armored cars basically, exchanging fire with some Palestinians. So remember, this is Matt Bradley, his team on the ground. Look. Israelis are coming in with their armored vehicles and in front of them, an armored bulldozer to take out And they're exchanging fire with Palestinian youth. You're going to see in a second, well, it was Matt Bradley and his team go in there. This is his funerals were held today for some of the 12 Palestinians killed in the biggest Israeli airstrikes in the region in nearly two decades. Matt is joining us now from Jerusalem. So we saw, Matt, what you've been through over the last 24 hours. Talk to us about the situation now. Where do things stand? Yeah, well, we went back to Janine, and what we saw was really, Ali, um, you know, a community that is literally and figuratively picking up the pieces from what was not an unprecedented operation, but was a really extraordinary operation, the, the worst we've seen in the West Bank by the Israelis for the past 20 years. So this was surprising. You mentioned those missiles that had been fired by the Israelis. That's something, a style of warfare that we haven't seen in that part of this region for 20 years. And so it really marked a dramatic escalation from what is the normal level of violence that we have seen uh, with small arms and that kind of thing. What we witnessed last night really was extraordinary. And you saw a little taste of that in that video that you just showed. And, you know, it, it just goes to show that uh, there are a lot of militants in that area. They are carrying small arms. They were shooting at the Israelis who were fully armed uh, in armored trucks and an armored bulldozer, which we've seen being used a lot uh, throughout the West Bank for really for, for decades. So, um, you know, what is what is interesting here is that this didn't really blossom into a larger, broader war. We saw some missiles, some rockets fired from the Gaza Strip. The Israelis answered that with missiles fired on Gaza. But so far, what we saw in Janine it was quiet, at least for now, Hallie. There often tends to be in these moments here, Matt, when, when violence escalates in this region here, this kind of tit-for-tat moment. What is the expectation for, let's say, the next few days, the next few weeks? Well, so far, you know, from what I saw in Janine, it looks like the militants, they were attending these funerals. There were 12 people who were killed. At least five of them are confirmed to have been militant people. Um, but so far, people were satisfied. They felt as though the fact that the Israelis left after only 48 hours meant that they were victorious. We saw some people flashing victory signs. But we heard that statement from Benjamin Netanyahu. He essentially said last night it was mission accomplished, but he left open a window for further incursions into Janine or into other places in the West Bank. It's clear that he could do something else again because he has that political heft. He's back in power now, and he's surrounded by all of these right-wing government ministers who have been cheerleading this operation uh, as it's been going on for the last 48 hours, many of them calling for more. So we could see more of that same style of violence, Hallie, in the days and weeks ahead. Matt Bradley, live for us from Jerusalem. Matt, thank you for being there in the region, uh, to you and your team as well. Appreciate it. Coming up, an investigation in Southern California now after some disturbing video showed police slamming a woman to the ground outside a grocery store. Plus, another country might ban Barbie over a map. The geopolitical controversy about the summer's big blockbuster to be coming up. An actress who pleaded guilty for her role in a sex trafficking case, apparently now released from prison early. We've got more on that in a couple of minutes. But first tonight, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is looking into how two deputies acted while detaining a couple at a grocery store last month, taking them off field duty now. As that incident, all captured on body cam, is being investigated. We're going to show you some of the video, but we have to warn you, it is hard to watch. You can see here, the woman is like taking video of what happened on her phone. When deputies grab her, they seem to throw her to the ground. They're holding her down now, spraying her. You can see her there. They're about to spray her with pepper spray. The police were responding to reports of an alleged robbery. The LA County Sheriff's Department says the couple matched the description given by store security and calls to 911, but they haven't released any details about those descriptions in the call. Steve Patterson is joining us now. What else do we know about what happened and why there was this use of force in the parking lot? 
Yeah, uh, Hallie, we're, we're trying to uncover more. We have requests yeah. out to the Sheriff's Department. Want to make it clear again, of course, if you do play that video over me, it can be hard to watch at places that weren't even shown there. Uh, so this happens on June 24th. It's in the parking lot of a Lancaster grocery store. That's in, of course, Los Angeles County. So these La Los Angeles County deputies, deputies respond. They are responding, as you mentioned, to this, the descriptions of two people that they believe are involved in a burglary in, process, in progress, as they call it, inside the store. We don't know what happened inside the store. Police not releasing those details, along with the descriptions that they heard, as you mentioned, of the suspected uh, burglars. But they get on scene. They start detaining that man. The woman is protesting. The man is protesting. He doesn't know why he's being detained. Then they take the woman down, as you laid out, forcefully, threatening to punch her as well, and then using that pepper spray when she's on the ground. Now, the Sheriff's Department has responded in a few ways. First, they didn't have to release the video this early. I think it, we should say that, that the, there was a, a pretty quick release of this video, uh, along with a statement from the sheriff himself, Sheriff Luna. Uh, in a statement, I can read it for you. Sheriff Luna says uh, he has made it clear that he expects department personnel to treat all members of the public with dignity and respect, and that personnel who do not uphold our training standards will be held accountable. There are representatives for these deputies. They have spoken to local affiliates saying that the deputies didn't bring this woman down because she was filming. They did because she was part of the investigation. They wanted to make that clear. But of course, all of this now under investigation as we try to learn more. Hallie. Steve Patterson live for us there in California. Steve, thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, former Smallville actor Allison Mack has been released from prison early, according to federal records. She pleaded guilty to her role in a sex trafficking case involving the group Nexium. Remember them? Kind of a cult-like group back in 2019. She was sentenced to three years in prison. At the time, prosecutors said the actor deserved less time behind bars because she cooperated with investigators. Number two, the Philippines is considering banning the Barbie movie because of a map that's shown in it. It shows the so-called Nine Dash Line that reflects China's claims to territory in the South China Sea, which the Philippines disagrees with. Vietnam actually banned the Barbie movie for the same reason not too long ago. Number three, Jenny Craig. You know the the brand, the weight loss people, they're kind of coming back, sort of. Remember, Jenny Craig went bankrupt back in May after something like 40 years in business. But now the parent company of Nutrisystems is buying the Jenny Craig brand. They're still gonna offer food and coaching, but Jenny Craig's actual weight loss centers will not reopen. The whole thing's gonna be virtual now. Number four, climate activists. Look at this, interrupting play at Wimbledon during a couple of matches today. Protesters from the group Just Stop Oil ran onto the court. They obviously threw, you can see it, the orange confetti, pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. They were dragged away by security and arrested. The organization wants the British government to stop new oil, gas, and coal projects. Number five, since nobody won Powerball Monday night, it is up for grabs again tonight with the top prize, $546 million. That's a lot of money. Nobody's hit all the numbers since April, so like, hey, maybe you have a shot tonight. If you don't win, the $427 million Mega Millions jackpot has its next drawing on Friday. Good luck. So listen, this viral video of this tense moment between a door dasher and a Texas customer posted on TikTok is bringing up this big debate over tipping culture in the U.S. It has a lot of people feeling a lot of ways. I want you to watch if you haven't seen it. Look. Um, I just want to say it's a nice house for a $5 tip. <laughs> You're welcome. Ooh, so sounds like a little bit of an expletive there from the Dasher, kind of an attitude. $5 tip on a $20 pizza. So that's, you know, a 25% tip. Then in a series of posts, the DoorDash customer who got the exchange on her ring camera, doorbell camera or whatever, said, how much should I be tipping on a $20 pie? She says she herself has worked in the service industry for more than a decade and tips, in her words, very well. So what happened to the DoorDasher, the driver? A spokesperson for the company confirmed that a worker has been removed from the platform, basically fired, in connection with this, saying that respectfully asking for a tip is acceptable, but abusing or harassing someone is never acceptable. Vicki Wynn joins us now with more on this. And this has struck such a chord, I think, for people, because it's about tipping, but it's also about the gig economy here, right? And the idea of, like, was this just a one-off thing, maybe a... a 
an attitude apple in the bunch, right? Or is this about um, workers in the gig economy struggling with low pay from these companies and trying to figure it out, piece it together with tips? Talk us through some of this and where this DoorDash driver is now. Hallie, you're absolutely right in terms of there being at least two sides to this tipping coin. Let's start on the consumer side, right? There's a bit of tipping fatigue happening right now. You've been there, I've been there. Someone hands you a donut and they turn the little screen around and suddenly it's, do you want to tip 15, 20, 25%? And there are all these people in the line behind you. You feel almost like you got to tip something. It's a tough time out there. Uh, but on the other side, take a look at what DoorDashers actually make. There's really an argument that if you pay people a living wage, they're not going to be so aggro. DoorDash dashers make anywhere between two and $10 per delivery based on time and distance. Now, I don't know exactly where in Texas this woman lives, but is there an argument to be made? Maybe you have a super long driveway, you live way out somewhere in the boonies, and maybe $5 on a $20 pizza isn't generous enough. But the bottom line is, it's never an excuse for dropping the F-bomb and, and behaving in that manner. And that is why DoorDash uh, ended its relationship with that driver. It's this whole question, though, of like, what do you, like, when should you press the tip for the donut person at the counter, right? Like, in other words, like, what do people tip? I mean, I see it, I think you see it and you read about it in like the restaurant world too, right? Like, it used to be kind of 18% was like a, a good tip, 18 to 20%. Now it's like 25 to 30%. All of it like adds to the bill, but also restaurant workers deserve it. Delivery workers, the argument goes, deserve it, right? Like, who sets the standard? It's just us. The etiquette experts would say always tip as much as you can, and particularly for services that require actual labor, right? So the good news is most Americans are aware of that. Take a look at the list of places that Americans say they almost always tip. First, it starts with actual restaurant servers. 77% of Americans say they tip their servers. Hairdressers and barbers, come on. If you're not going to tip your hairdresser, I mean, that person's working on your moneymaker. That's important. 65% of people tip there. <laughs> Bartenders, 65%. Delivery drivers, 61%. And then you go down. Baristas, I was surprised that it was only down right around 38%. Here's the thing. Creditcards.com just did a survey, Hallie, and they are finding that Americans are less generous than we were during the pandemic and even less generous mm. than we were back in 2019. One big factor could be inflation. It really is hitting everyone. So here's the thing. Carry small bills. Cash is always, almost always more appreciated than just adding that amount onto your uh, credit card. So even if you can only tip one or two dollars, it's very appreciated. The other thing is be discreet about it. Don't be a big showboater. And even if you can't tip as generously as you would like to, always be respectful. I know some of these things sound like common sense, but just being kind can go a long way, too. It's a motto for life. Vicki Wynn, thank you very much. It's good to see you. When we come back here on the show, the mercenary boss who led that rebellion against the Russian president, allegedly in Belarus, even though he hasn't been seen in public yet, we're live with Keir Simmons, who is in that country tonight. He just arrived. Plus, Japan's planning to release tons of nuclear wastewater into the ocean, and the UN says it's nothing to worry about. We'll explain next. So tonight, Japan's moving forward with its plan to release more than a million tons of radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. It's stuff from the Fukushima nuclear power plant, even though there's been so much pushback from countries nearby. A UN nuclear watchdog agency gave the green light to this plan, saying that it does meet safety standards and has, I'm quoting here, negligible radiological impact on human beings and the environment. Why is this happening? Remember that devastating 2011 earthquake and tsunami? It damaged the Fukushima plant. It left behind a ton of dangerous radioactive material and all that debris. Japan kept using water to try to keep the reactors cool. So now it has something like 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water, contaminated water, to try to get rid of. Plan is to dump it into the ocean, but a lot of people are worried about what kind of effect that's going to have. I want to bring in Josh Letterman. Can you answer that question, right? What kind of effect will it have, and why are the uh, neighboring countries, countries nearby, so concerned? Well, UN nuclear authorities, Hallie, say it will have negligible effect. It will be totally fine because this water, remember, has been building up for more than a decade ever since that incident, and the Japanese have essentially been pumping water 
into the nuclear reactor to cool it down. Uh, in that process, it gets contaminated. And then they've built more than a, a thousand storage tanks to hold it. But frankly, Hallie, they are running out of space. And so the water that is in those tanks has already been treated by something called an advanced liquid processing system. Uh, that enables them to take out most of the bad stuff, but it still has a little bit of a radioactive form of hydrogen left in it. So they're planning to dilute that even further before they pump it out into the ocean through a tunnel, basically an undersea tunnel that will be more than half a mile long. And authorities say at that point, it is far within the levels at which it's safe for humans to drink water containing that isotope. So explain the concern then and the skepticism here. Right. Well, basically, every country in the region has expressed concern about this, from China to South Korea to the island nations, uh, because they say they're concerned not only about the effect it could have on humans who may drink the water, but also about the sea salt, about a marine life living in that water. The Chinese foreign ministry uh, even cited a poll that showed, spoiler alert, most people don't want radioactive material going into their you are, water. You're kidding, Josh. Boy, of this plan, I'm shocked by I know, that. Right. Oh Total shocker there. Why wouldn't you want radioactive stuff in the water that may end up either in your, what you're drinking or the fish that you're going to be eating? But the supporters of this plan, Hallie, have pointed out that it is routine for nuclear plants to release wastewater that does yeah. contain this radioactive material, which is frankly naturally occurring. It's already in water. Right. It's already in your body. Uh, and in fact, the China, the Chinese government, they have nuclear power plants that is releasing water that uh, has far higher levels than what we're even going to see coming out of Fukushima. Josh Letterman, uh, thank you very much for breaking that one down. We'll see how this goes. Appreciate it. Tonight, new and increasingly concerning questions about where the guy who led that rebellion on Russia actually is now. We're talking about the head of the Wagner Group. This person, you see him, Evgeny Prigozhin. He's said to be in Belarus. That's apparently where he's been exiled to. But he hasn't actually been seen publicly since he led that revolt. Remember about a couple weeks ago when he and his soldiers basically marched on Moscow? It comes as we're also seeing today Russian President Vladimir Putin making his uh, one of his first public appearances since that rebellion, saying his country is more united than ever. This is as Russia and Ukraine point fingers at each other, each country now accusing the other of planning to attack one of Europe's biggest nuclear plants. Keir Simmons has made his way to Belarus. He is joining us now. Do we even know where Yevgeny Prigozhin is tonight, Keir? And explain why that matters when it comes to sort of the international stakes of things. We don't know, Ali, honestly. Uh, this is the first time that international journalists have been in uh, Belarus uh, since that whole rebellion and then not rebellion kind of escapade, if you like, with Wagner forces run by Pogosian heading up the freeway towards Moscow. Since that happened just under uh, two weeks ago, it's about 62 miles from here to the place where it's reported that there are now Wagner uh, camps uh, set up, though that hasn't been confirmed by NBC uh, News. Meanwhile, Pogosian's plane has been seen on flight tracker moving around, zigzagging between Belarus and Russia. Again, that's not being confirmed by NBC News. And of course, it couldn't be because you don't know who's uh, on uh, that plane. We have heard from him in two audio messages, one cryptically suggesting that Wagner fighters at some point will win more victories in Ukraine. We don't know what that means. So it is something of a mystery. On the one hand, we've seen President Putin kind of, you know, putting out his power, if you like, showing his power on, on, on the television uh, with various uh, chances to, to meet his people and all that kind of thing. And then we haven't really seen uh, Prigozhin uh, at all. Why it matters, well, you know, we got here just today, Hali. It, it seems like a pretty relaxed place, um, a country we, that still has mm. a KGB. We walk straight through uh, immigration. Uh, but when we talk, spoke to people today a little bit, it is clear that they are anxious, uh, many uh, suggesting they don't really like the idea of Wagner being here. And that's maybe not a surprise, given uh, that they've already uh, led one rebellion uh, in Russia, right. this mercenary group. What about what we're hearing from Vladimir Putin in the last 12, 18 hours or so? Is any of that um, adding relevancy to this moment in Belarus? 
Well, we haven't really heard him do more uh, than he did appear with international leaders in the past 48 hours saying, uh, thanking them for their support. We haven't really heard him do more of kind of the detail, uh, if you like. Uh, and so, no, he, he hasn't really shed light on it. But, but here's an interesting point uh, about uh, all this. Uh, we haven't also heard from uh, General Saravikin, who uh, there are mm. reports may have known a little bit about this rebellion. So the question here is, uh, will President Putin uh, clamp down on those he thinks may have been involved, whoever they might be, or will he not? Uh, and if it's the latter case, will that show weakness uh, in the eyes of people around him? But if it's the, if it's the former case, uh, will that actually make things worse? I mean, th that's why it's a real challenge for President Putin. I should say, there's no sign that it's impacting the front lines in Ukraine. So, I mean, there are many questions here, inevitably, and it is, yeah. it, uh, once again, always challenging to figure out what happens next and what the future looks like. Kier Simmons, live for us in Belarus. I'm sure we'll be checking back in with you, Kier, in the days to come. Really appreciate you being there. Coming up, a new study finds that depression after a traumatic brain injury may be a different kind of disease than the depression most people know. And it may need different treatment. We're getting into why that's so important. Plus, a search and recovery mission in Yosemite National Park. What we know about the moments before a hiker got swept away in a creek. Some groundbreaking new research tonight shows that the depression some people get after a traumatic brain injury, like after a concussion, is actually a totally different kind of depression than people who never had a brain injury at all. It's so different, they even want to give this a different name. Researchers suggest calling it TBI affective syndrome. It may even need different treatments than other kinds of depression, rather than just the standard drug regimen. Understanding all of this is a big deal because research previously shows that people with TBI are eight times more likely to develop depression, to get depression, than people who don't. Let's bring in Dr. John Torres. Explain why it is such a big deal that researchers were, be able, to, were, were able to tell the difference between these two types of depression in the first place and the impact that could have on patient treatment. And Hallie, there's a variety of reasons this is a big deal. One of them you alluded to, they're more likely to develop depression. But the other one is that depression doesn't respond to treatment that other types of depression do. So it's harder to treat them. On top of that, their symptoms seem to be a little bit different than with people with TBI who have depression. One of the big ones is irritability, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But the main thing is we talked to a researcher earlier today, and he said essentially what happened is they took brains of people who had TBI and suffered depression and compared them to those who had depression without TBI, and they found out using artificial intelligence and looking at 200 million data points in the brain that the brain is activated in different areas when they have TBI with depression versus depression without TBI. And so they know now that it's in those different areas, they can look at targeting specific treatments to those areas to see if it can help out. Number one, because again, it's resistant to normal types of training, but also it seems, or treatment, but also it seems to be a different type of depression as well, and one that definitely needs needs to be treated, Hallie. Is there something that people should be thinking about, right, or communicating with their doctors about if they do, let's say, get a concussion? And I don't want to, it's, it's a, a concussion is not a traumatic brain injury. Those are two separate things, right? But like repeated concussions can lead to TBI. So is there like a practical, um, like a practical thing that people should pull out of this? So one of the big things they should pull out of this is that everyone's symptoms are different and we're looking at this individualized medicine, but there are different, there are things that people should be looking at for depression in general and particularly for TBI-associated depression. You can see there, the big ones are insomnia, that anxiety, that feels, feeling of worthless, worthlessness, that irritability seems to be the ones that are associated with TBI-type depression. And so again, these are things to look for. If you notice these, then definitely talk to your doctor about them, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, important info. Thank you very much. You bet. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, four people were killed and several others hurt in a shooting at a 4th of July party in Shreveport, Louisiana. We told you about this earlier in the show, one of the 17 mass shootings over the holiday weekend. More than 200 people were in the area when this all happened, according to police. No arrests yet. Out of our Western Bureau, officials say a hiker in Yosemite has been swept away by a creek and has been missing for days. He was backpacking with a group of people Sunday and hasn't been seen since. Yosemite is now asking for help finding him, but his family says teams are now shifting to a recovery mission.
And out of our Southern Bureau, a semi-truck carrying cheese hit a fire truck today in Atlanta, hurting three firefighters and far less importantly, spilling cheese all over the road. Obviously, had to get cleaned up. Fortunately, the firefighters are expected to be okay. Police say they don't know how the crash happened. Still to come, Ben and Jerry's getting put on blast. Not over Chunky Monkey, but it's 4th of July message. The conservative backlash we're starting to see online and on the campaign trail when we get back. A potential brewing backlash, a brewing boycott online and on the campaign trail against maybe Ben and Jerry's after the very popular ice cream company called for the U.S. to return to, and I'm quoting here, stolen indigenous land on its 4th of July message on Twitter. Overall, we saw uh, Mike Pence, for example, at an ice cream parlor slam Ben and Jerry's for this. Listen. I think the American people are sick and tired of woke corporations and uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's recent statement about, about our nation being built on stolen lands is deeply offensive to every American. And I think it's one of the reasons why uh, Lamar's Iowa is the ice cream capital of the world and not Burlington, Vermont. Already one controversial influencer, Jordan Peterson, who has something like four million followers, says Ben and Jerry's is looking hard for a Budweiser moment. Of course, referring to the controversy and the boycott from Bud Light after they partnered with trans influencer Dylan Mulvaney. And listen, this is not the first time that Ben & Jerry's has dipped its toe into more political waters. Earlier this year, there were other boycott calls after the company's co-founder says the U.S. should stop sending weapons to Ukraine. Back in 2020, Ben & Jerry's partnered with former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. They created that Change the World flavor in support of Kaepernick's push to protest police violence and systemic racism. The company also launched a pecan resist flavor to take a stand against what it called regressive policies from back in the Trump administration. We should note Ben & Jerry's has not returned the NBC News' request for comment. NBC's Aaron Gilchrist is following this for us. So listen, Ben & Jerry's has been like really always politically active. So walk us through the latest here. Could this really be a kind of Bud Light moment for them or, or not? Because that comparison may not really square given the facts of the matter. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, look, you go to the Ben & Jerry's website and there's a tab for activism. Activism, social commentary like this, has been a part of the Ben & Jerry's brand for a very long time now. In this particular instance, as you pointed out there, Hallie, we're talking about a tweet that came out on Independence Day, uh, the hottest day of the year, not about ice cream from this ice cream company, but instead it was about uh, returning land to indigenous people in uh, in South Dakota, in particular, this references Mount Rushmore being on the, the Black Hills uh, area of, uh, of the Dakotas. And it, 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 at this point, you know, if you look at the history, as you said, of Ben and Jerry over the years, they've taken people to task on some of these issues. In this instance, calling for us to, to start talking about and thinking about returning that land, not just the government, but people in general. We talked to a, a marketing, a public relations expert about how Ben & Jerry's does business, and his take is that this campaign was deliberate, that it was very well planned out. Listen. They know their, their customers really well, and I don't think that they're concerned at all about far-right boycotts, because that is not who their customers are. Uh, what, uh, what they're doing right now is taking a lot of licks on Twitter, but at the same time selling, you know, scoops and scoops of ice cream. And so I asked uh, Professor Richard if he thinks that Bud Light is going to be uh, sort of a, an indicator of what could happen with Ben & Jerry's. And he says, no, not very likely. Bud Light sells beer. They don't try to wade into controversies. But as we saw with the Bud Light campaign, they did. In this case, Ben & Jerry's has made it a part of their brand that they right. talk about the issues that the company believes is important. And I would ask, Aaron, if that has been good for business, but given that you can find Ben & Jerry's at, like, literally any corner store, I mean, at least in the, in the, where I live, like, yeah. it seems to be that the answer is yes, that, that Ben & Jerry's political bent at times has not hurt its bottom line. And Ben and & Jerry's will tell you that it's nonpartisan, that it talks about the issues that it believes should be talked about uh, at any given point in time. Just last week, there were tweets about affirmative action. Back in April, Ben & Jerry's had statements to make about cannabis laws around 420. Uh, and so this is a company that takes on the issues that it believes are important. I want to show you part of what Ben & Jerry's put on their website uh, about this particular issue. And it said, uh, in answering the question, why are we talking about this? What is the meaning of Independence Day for those whose land this country stole, those who were murdered? 
plundered and forced with brutal violence onto reservations, those who were pushed for their holy places and denied their freedom. The point here, I think, Hallie, is that Ben and Jerry's wants people not just to be buying their ice cream, but to be talking about some of the things that make some people uncomfortable yeah. in this country. Aaron Gilchrist, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. the air tonight with team coverage of a one, two, three punch of bad weather coast to coast. You've got the rain with one city bracing for more storms. You've got the heat with some of the hottest temperatures we've ever seen. And you've got the bad air quality that one in five of us are dealing with right now. Live coverage from every angle on all of it in just a second. Plus some brand new information just into us on the new things that the Secret Service is doing to figure out how a little bag of cocaine ended up in a really busy part of the White House. And new details tonight about a potentially problematic confrontation at international waters. You'll see some video, and we'll talk about how the Navy managed to stop Iran from taking two of somebody else's ships. Plus, Japan plans to release radioactive wastewater into the ocean really soon. Why some top officials and top experts say, hey, not to worry. Plus, our team digging into groundbreaking new research just into us, showing depression for people with traumatic brain injuries is totally different than depression for people who have never had a brain injury at all. We'll break it down later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight, just a day after the hottest day in modern history, tens of millions of Americans are in the path of extreme weather, from more record-breaking temperatures to bad storms to really bad air quality. You've got 29 million people looking at a ton of rain, very strong wind, hail in the Rockies and the Midwest. And how you know it's getting bad? We're seeing some ground stops just tonight at several airports around the country. You've got Chicago in the Midwest set to take another beating after seeing record rain earlier this week. Look what those storms did there. You also have the sun beating down on almost everybody with a lot of people, 29 million, seeing record-breaking temperatures. Another brutal day after what we saw on July 4th. The hottest day since they started keeping track of this kind of thing. Experts say it hasn't been this hot on the planet in 125,000 years. That's like caveman era stuff. Tying it all together in maybe the worst way, one in five Americans is breathing some really bad air right now because of dangerous ozone levels and those Canadian wildfires still burning. You're seeing a bunch of cities right, right here where this is a problem. I want to bring in our team that's covering this. Shaq Brewster is in Chicago for us. Meteorologist Bill Karens is joining us too. Shaq, let me start with you in Chicago. Let's start here with the storms. How bad is it going to get? Right now it looks not too bad, maybe a little cloudy. It is probably not going to stay that way. Right. Exactly, Hallie. Looks can be deceiving. Right now, it's fairly nice. People are walking out, enjoying the downtown weather right now. But when you look at the radar, you see a pretty menacing line of storms heading in this direction. Chicago, one of those areas that are under the threat of severe weather. You're talking about some uh, about 16 million people between the Midwest all the way through to Colorado facing the threat of severe storms. What we're talking about when we're talking about severe storms, torrential downpours. You're talking about heavy wind, lightning, possible hail in some areas. So that is heading in this direction. Some areas already dealing with that right now. That's something that led to a lot of cancellations of uh, July 4th events yesterday in the past couple of days. In addition to that, you have other areas of the country dealing with that sweltering heat. You mentioned the 29 million people under some heat advisory right now. You have many cities who had record-breaking heat uh, today alone after we got that study about July 4th being one of the hottest days ever on record, uh, if you look at the uh, average uh, globally. And then, Hallie, that contributes to the air quality issues that we're having here in about 60 million Americans dealing yeah. with poor air quality and air advisories. Here in Chicago, it's not as bad as what we saw last week when you really couldn't even see what was behind me, but it's just another concern for folks uh, dealing with the effects of uh, of what uh, Mother Nature has to offer. That is for sure. You talk about the reason why the air quality is so bad. Partly it's because of those Canadian wildfires up north, out west. Yeah. Wildfire season is revving up there, including in Washington state. Talk us through that. Yeah, a pretty bad wildfire there. Uh, we're looking at a fire that's about 5% contained, according to firefighters there. It's gone through more than 200, or excuse me, more than 500 acres of property. We know about 10 buildings have been damaged, but about 1,000 residents 
have had to be evacuated. The concern there is that the conditions, the dry, temp the dry weather, the uh, wind is not helping firefighters combat that fire. So that's something that we're definitely keeping an eye on uh, right now. As I mentioned, about 100, or excuse me, 1,000 residents have so far been displaced. Shaq Brewster, live for us in Chicago, dealing with all of it. Shaq, thank you. Bill Karens is joining us now, too. So where else besides Chicago do people need to be on alert tonight for some of this extreme weather? Yeah, Chicago's the worst, and then it's scattered everywhere else. And Hallie, I had to do some quick math because I just looked up what the ground delay is at O'Hare Airport, and they said it's 237 minutes. And I'm in my head going, that's four right. hours of delays they're yikes. averaging right now. So that's a yikes. So, uh, yeah, anywhere out of Chicago is just a nightmare right now. And those storms are just approaching. So this is going to continue there for another two or three hours. They'll probably go under a ground stop here shortly. Uh, we've also got storms right over I-95 heading into South Carolina. These are your more garden variety storms, not if you're traveling or flying, but they're not going to do a lot of damage. And as we've been showing you, this is the storms we just showed you where they are, the strong ones between Chicago and Peoria. And then we're going to see new storms developing here from Denver to Pueblo all the way to Oklahoma. And tomorrow, going to do it again in the same area. So we'll probably have some flash flooding concerns too. And we've added this little enhanced risk area. This is where we could get some large hail, maybe even an isolated tornado or two. Both coast, east and west coast, should be clear of any severe weather tomorrow. Uh, what about the heat? Because I think that's what everybody wants. Uh, like, and again, it's summer, it's hot. Right. Like, obviously, we know that's the case. It is not summer everywhere, however. In some places, it, it is winter. And when you look at the, the temperatures all around the planet, including the places where it is winter, the average temperature was about 63 degrees on July 4th. That is apparently the hottest it's ever been on this earth since they started tracking this kind of thing. How should we be thinking about the way that heat is in our lives now, probably for the foreseeable future? Uh, we've had climate scientists telling us that our planet is getting warmer and it's going to continue to get warmer as long as we continue to burn fossil fuels. That's the greenhouse effect. So it shouldn't surprise everyone because that's not the only thing that controls it. You know, the old records in 2016, that was this line right here. So a lot of people are like, well, if it's getting warmer every day, how come we're not just doing it day after day after day? It's because there's other things that happen. And one of the biggest climate drivers is El Nino and La Nina. That's the cooling of the Pacific Ocean or the heating of it. It's been cool the last three years. That's why we haven't broken in a lot of all-time records. But now that we're heading into El Nino, which is the warming of the Pacific, that means the whole planet has like a, a, a octane boost of warmth. And then you put that onto what we've done to our planet with uh, global warming. And that's why we're breaking this record here in, in early July. And we still got three to four weeks to go. We'll probably break the all-time record for the planet, recorded, by the way, that goes to 1940. We'll probably break that easily a dozen, two dozen more times the rest of this summer until we start cooling off. I think this was even a bigger headline. This is, we just got done with the warmest June ever recorded on the planet. And everywhere you see in these dark colors, this is the Atlantic, this is the Central Atlantic, this is the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. Everywhere with the dark colors was the warmest ever recorded. This June was off the charts warmer than any June we previously had. And we're going to continue to see it warm in the lower 48. But Hallie, people have to realize the difference between weather and climate. In the lower 48, our June was average. It wasn't hot, it wasn't cold, it was pretty so normal. But the rest of the planet was the warmest ever by far. So, like, whenever you hear someone say, oh, my spring wasn't that bad or it wasn't that right. hot or it was cold near me, they're talking weather. They're not talking climate. Climate is totally different. What happens in the lower 48 is insignificant compared to the whole planet. It's a good point, good context, good reminder. Bill Karens, thank you as always. We've got some new reporting and some new questions facing the White House late today about how cocaine... A little bag of cocaine ended up in a really busy part of the West Wing inside the White House. With our team just hearing in the last hour that investigators are looking for DNA and fingerprints to try to figure out who brought that in, according to an official familiar with this investigation. They had the press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, getting hammered with questions about this whole thing today, about security protocols, etc. She mostly deferred. Listen. The Secret Service is investigating this, is investigating what happened over the weekend, and we have confidence that they will get to the bottom of this. Here's what else we're finding out today, that a formal lab test of this little baggie filled with white powder came back positive for cocaine, according to an official with knowledge of that investigation. It was found Sunday night in an area that a lot of people go in and out of, so it could be hard for the Secret Service to figure out who actually brought it in. I want to bring in Mike Memoli, who is on the, uh, can we just say it, Mem, the brand new... 
cocaine West Wing beat, I guess. Like, it is just, it is such a, it's such a strange thing that happened. The building had to be evacuated for a little while. Now there are, like, pretty legitimate questions about security protocols. How can you sneak a bag of white powder into the White House, or how does that end up here? It seemed to me, from reading between the lines, from what we saw at the press briefing today, um, was that it, it's potentially a visitor who may have brought this in, left it behind? What else do we know? Yeah, Hal, you've been on this beat before, so you know that there are just some times that things come up that you never thought you'd be covering. But here I am say saying the word cocaine dozens of times today uh, from the White House North Lawn. And really, there are some significant issues here as it relates to security protocols at the White House. One of the questions I asked Karine Jean-Pierre was about whether the Secret Service is investigating simply the facts of this case to determine whether there any protocols were insufficient or potentially were sidestepped in this case, uh, or if this is about criminality. You just can't bring cocaine into the White right. House. And she deferred those questions to the Secret Service. But it is important as part of this new reporting that we have, it's a source familiar with the investigation is stipulating that there are measures on the White House grounds, some we know about and some we don't, but that are intended to prevent simply the following. Weapons, things like guns that could be used to harm others, especially the protectees in the White House, uh, but also hazardous chemicals that could be weaponized. And okay, you're thinking so of sort of chemical agents, not yeah. necessarily illegal substances, to be sure, but things like cocaine. And so it also matters, Hallie, where you're coming in and where you're going in the White House. If you're one of dozens, hundreds that come through each week for public tours of the sort of more ceremonial spaces, including the part of the White House where the president does live, uh, there are different and higher levels of sort of the screening that then perhaps if you're just coming in like we do uh, on the press side of things at the Northwest Gate, uh, which is simply more of an airport style magnetometer. And so that's all part of the issues that are being surfaced by this very provocative discussion of cocaine being found in the White House. And it should be noted, too, as we're talking about, and you're right to, to point this, that the suggestion from the White House at this stage is that it was a visitor, not a White House staffer who they believe was responsible for this. We're still a long way from knowing if that's actually the that's case. Right. But that's right. Because it's, it, as they look through things like visitor logs, the security footage, uh, the potential DNA evidence of what was on this baggie, that might narrow the universe quickly, but it's going to be weeks until we know that. So, you, and you're, you're laying out something really important, which is that even though that seems to be the kind of suggestion between the lines, we don't actually know who, who it belongs to. And the reason why that's relevant is if it's a White House staffer, that's kind of a different level of, of as you say, potential criminality than it is um, for somebody who's a visitor, given it's somebody on the government payroll. I just want to pull this thread to make it super crystal clear, Mike, the reason why this is potentially a concern is because if there is a little dime-sized bag, I don't know, this big, right, of white powder, I don't know how big a dime is, but whatever, a small little bag of white powder, it's cocaine this time, right? I That's think the right. question that has come up is like, anthrax is also a white powder, right? Like if you can get a white powder bag into the white, it doesn't matter how much it is, that's the concern level. What I hear you saying is that there are protocols in place according to officials who you've talked to and our team has talked to to try to prevent that kind of thing. But that's, I just want to lay out for people, that's why there's like, this isn't just like, oh my gosh, wow, this is a crazy thing that happened. There's a security reason for this too. Well, one of the protocols was one that was employed immediately, which was to evacuate the White House. As soon That's as right. this was discovered, uh, they immediately cleared the White House, albeit on a Sunday night when there were not nearly as many people as who might have been there, for instance, today during a working day at the White House. Uh, but that was the very first action taken when they discovered this. That's one of the questions we've also been asking is how rigorous and regular are these tours of what they described as highly traveled areas of the West Wing? Because one of the key things that might narrow down who was responsible here is was this something that was brought in on Sunday and discovered on Sunday? Or is this something that was maybe in the back of a cubby where somebody might put their wallet, their phone, who was going in for a tour and may have stayed there for weeks at a time? Mike Memoli, live for us uh, on the White House North Lawn. Again, uh, never a dull, Mike, as they say. Thank you. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Let's take it to Philadelphia now, where people there are in shock and in grief tonight, with police looking for a motive in the killing of five people Monday night, one of at least 17 mass shootings in this country over the holiday weekend with as many as 18 people dead. In Philly, the suspect there is being held without bail after making his first appearance in court today. Here's how a local ER doctor put it. The bullets really don't care. They don't care what faith you are, what party you belong to. They cause damage, not only to the victims, but to the families who we then have to go to talk to in the family rooms and the wider community, as you saw, where the streets are now empty. Uh, because people are scared to go out in the street. 
speaking there of the fear that people have of going in the street after what we've seen over the holiday weekend. In this instance, police say that the suspect had an AR-style rifle and a ghost gun. So that's one of these untraceable guns that people can put together on their own. It's usually from parts that are sold online. Just within the last hour or so, Philadelphia's mayor is announcing a new lawsuit to try to keep these ghost guns out of the city. Our George Solis has been covering this story and is joining us now live from Philly. George, can we start there? What is What else do we know about this lawsuit? Uh, why the Philadelphia mayor, I mean, clearly wants to keep ghost guns out of the city and about this, this mass shooting that happened in that city? Yeah, good uh, evening, Hallie. We'll start with the first part. Uh, the Philadelphia Mayor Jim Kenney adamant that this is a recurring problem here in the city of Philadelphia, as it is in a lot of major cities. These ghost guns that appear that are untraceable, and so he is filing these lawsuits. He is calling on lawmakers to do more than just talk, to actually pass some legislation to make sure these types of mass shootings don't happen here in Philadelphia. Of course, the community, as you mentioned, is shocked. We had five people that lost their lives as a result of this mass shooting, including a teenager. We also had other people that were wounded, including a pair of toddlers, one of them shot in the legs, the other one receiving uh, injuries to the eye as a result of shattered glass. The suspect appearing in court today via closed circuit television, not saying anything, just appearing in that white jumpsuit saying yes and no to understanding the charges. Again, the motive still under investigation. Authorities not officially commenting on the suspect's social media, which has been out there for some time. A lot of moving parts and a lot of interest in this case, understandably, given that it is a very complex investigation, one that is still ongoing, we should add. But I do want you to listen to what some of the family members of the victims are saying tonight about this horrific mass shooting here in the city. I don't understand how someone could just do that to my brother. Like, he... I really love him. Yeah, and there is a lot of that, Hallie. I spoke with the grandmother of that 15-year-old teen who was killed, and she is just devastated. Her voice hoarse from just the amount of crying and the emotional toll this has taken on this community. And we know this is not the only mass shooting that has taken place right. this holiday week. The shootings are rampant. And so, again, lawmakers, a lot of city officials are calling on leaders to do more because they simply just cannot stand this happening yet again, Hallie. Well, pull, pull back on that, George, because you're right. You're standing there in the city of Philadelphia. There are cities all over the country that had to deal with these kinds of attacks over the holiday weekend. We're looking at Shreveport here in D.C., in Boston, in Fort Worth, Texas. This is an epidemic of gun violence in this country, and I imagine you're hearing that from Philly officials. Yeah, that's right. And as we discussed, the mayor, Jim Kenney, hold talking to officials today and talk, talking to the media, saying he is fed up. He was using some pretty strong language here mm -hmm. today, saying every time the city comes up with some type of legislation or there is some type of meaningful discussion about gun reform, it's shot down at some level. And so he's saying this cannot continue to stand. Take, take a listen to some more words today from Mayor Jim Kenney. As a city, we all have endured these tragedies together while investing hundreds of millions of dollars to address the problem. The root of the problem is the proliferation of guns in our city and in our country. Guns are the common denominator in every single shooting. Yeah, and again, as we see, right, the mayor, probably not wrong when you have this number of shootings, this number of mass shootings that have occurred just in the last few days alone, Hallie. But again, the investigation in this mass shooting still ongoing, a lot of interest in this case. George Solis, live for us there in Philly. George, thank you. In Texas, victims' families are coming face-to-face -face with the attacker who killed the people they loved in one of the worst mass shootings in our country's history back in 2019 at a Walmart in El Paso. 23 people died in all, with one man who lost his wife and daughter breaking down outside today's sentencing hearing. You sit there and you think, man, if, if, you, if you didn't do what you did, I'd, I'd have my child, you know, at home and, and hug right now. Just a very emotional and difficult day for so many people. The shooter, in this case, who admitted to targeting Hispanic shoppers, now faces multiple life sentences. Guad Venegas has been covering this story. He's joining us now for more. Bring us up to speed, Guad. Where does this go? 
Hallie, a very emotional day. Uh, we heard from that victim speaking to the media. That's exactly what it was like inside the courtroom today. So this is a sentencing uh, hearing that's going to take a few days. So today we heard the victim impact statements. So multiple victims spoke about what it was like losing their loved ones. Uh, you talked about the multiple charges that the shooter pled guilty to, 90 uh, different charges. The judge this morning started the hearing by reading all of the names of the victims that died and also reading all of these charges. And then uh, later in the afternoon, we heard from these victims, the victim impact statements, very emotional. At one point, a 13-year-old, a soccer player who was inside that Walmart spoke of what the experience was like. Uh, she cried and, and she also addressed the shooter and told him, you can roll your eyes and do what you want, but you ruined my life. Getting a reaction from the shooter who shook his head to that. Uh, multiple victims addressed them directly. They cried, so it was a very, very emotional day. Many of them uh, talking about what it's been like for them for the last three years, describing the trauma when it comes to going into public spaces because of what they experienced. Uh, we expect another day of these statements coming tomorrow. So essentially for these victims that have lost loved ones, Helly, this is an opportunity for them to sit in that courtroom and address the shooter face to face, something perhaps they've been waiting for a very long time. It's been almost four years uh, since the shooting happened. In August, it'll be four years. And this is just uh, the federal case against them. Hallie, after he's sentenced uh, this week, we expect another trial uh, and state charges against them. And now in those charges, and then in the state court, uh, the district attorney's office is asking for a death penalty. So we have more to go in uh, these legal proceedings against the shooter in El Paso, Hallie. Squad Venegas, thank you very much. Take a look now at some new video that we're seeing late today with a military official telling NBC News the Navy had to stop Iran from taking over two commercial tankers off the coast of Oman. So look at this here. So take a look. Like you got to actually see it here. This appears to be one of the Iranian Navy vessels and then an oil tanker getting shot at by the Iranians before American ships came in and a U.S. ship came in and kind of like, you know, kind of flexed. Point being, convince the Iranians to leave, to go away, to back off. Iranian TV says the government denies trying to actually seize these tankers, but it's not like this is just a one-off. Look at all these headlines here. These are just some of the instances lately in which Iran has tried to go after merchant ships. I want to bring in NBC's Dan DeLuce, who is covering this one for us. Um, again, there is a pattern. There is a pattern of behavior here from the Iranians. Explain why that's significant and this move from the Navy now. Uh, it is about Iran flexing its muscles. They see themselves as a regional power, and they want to show that oil shipping can be disrupted if they want to disrupt it. However, this is a case where the U.S. was able to push back, and the Iranians had second thoughts when a USS destroyer, the McFall, showed up. Uh, but there's another part of this, which is we have seized oil tankers with Iranian oil bound for China. And the Iranians don't like that. That happened a few months ago. And so this, te this tension has just been building. But let's hear what a senior naval officer, uh, Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, had to say about all this. I think we can pull it up on screen here, this quote from him. Um, but essentially the point being that the, you know, the U.S. doesn't like this behavior from Iran, with um, the vice admiral saying he couldn't be prouder of the entire Central Command team, especially the exceptional effort by the crew of that ship for immediately responding and preventing another seizure. That's right. And the, against the background of all of this, though, are these quiet negotiations going on between the U.S. and Iran that could lead to the release of Americans who are being held there, and even maybe an agreement, a verbal agreement, to sort of contain Iran's nuclear program. So how does this ship situation affect those discussions? It obviously could disrupt the whole thing. So there's a very high stakes here. And of course, there's always the danger that there's actual shots fired between the U.S. Right. and the Iranians. Dan DeLuce, thank you very much. Stay close. Uh, lots going on tonight. Appreciate it, Dan. Thank you. To a powerful look now from the ground at the violence in the Middle East. Take a look at our NBC, ne NBC News team. They're in Janine in the West Bank, taking cover with Israeli armored vehicles rolling by, armored cars, and fire exchange with the Palestinians. Take a look at this. Was our Matt Bradley and his team trying to get away, trying to find some cover there with shots fired nearby, his crew right behind him on that wall with armored tanks rolling right on by. 
This is all happening as there is escalating violence now in the region. We've seen militants from the Gaza Strip firing rockets into Israel today. Israel, in response, hitting a weapons plant in this sort of latest round. Matt Bradley is joining us now from Jerusalem. We saw, Matt, what you've been through over the last 24 hours. Talk to us about the situation now. Where do things stand? Yeah, well, we went back to Janine, and what we saw was really, Ali, um, you know, a community that is literally and figuratively picking up the pieces from what was not an unprecedented operation, but was a really extraordinary operation, the, the worst we've seen in the West Bank by the Israelis for the past 20 years. So this was surprising. You mentioned those missiles that have been fired by the Israelis. That's something, a style of warfare that we haven't seen in that part of this region for 20 years. And so it really marked a dramatic escalation from what is the normal level of violence that we have seen uh, with small arms and that kind of thing. What we witnessed last night really was extraordinary. And you saw a little taste of that in that video that you just showed. And, you know, it, it just goes to show that uh, there are a lot of militants in that area. They are carrying small arms. They were shooting at the Israelis who were fully armed uh, in armored trucks and an armored bulldozer, which we've seen being used a lot uh, throughout the West Bank for really for, for decades. So, um, you know, what is what is interesting here is that this didn't really blossom into a larger, broader war. We saw some missiles, some rockets fired from the Gaza Strip. The Israelis answered that with missiles fired on Gaza. But so far, what we saw in Janine it was quiet, at least for now, Hallie. There often tends to be in these moments here, Matt, when, when violence escalates in this region here, this kind of tit-for-tat moment. What is the expectation for, let's say, the next few days, the next few weeks? Well, so far, you know, from what I saw in Janine, it looks like the militants, they were attending these funerals. There were 12 people who were killed. At least five of them are confirmed to have been militant people. Um, but so far, people were satisfied. They felt as though the fact that the Israelis left after only 48 hours meant that they were victorious. We saw some people flashing victory signs. But we heard that statement from Benjamin Netanyahu. He essentially said last night it was mission accomplished, but he left open a window for further incursions into Janine or into other places in the West Bank. It's clear that he could do something else again because he has that political heft. He's back in power now, and he's surrounded by all of these right-wing government ministers who have been cheerleading this operation uh, as it's been going on for the last 48 hours, many of them calling for more. So we could see more of that same style of violence, Hallie, in the days and weeks ahead. Matt Bradley, live for us from Jerusalem. Matt, thank you for being there in the region. Uh, to you and your team as well. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, some new details coming into us. After a bus dropped into a 75-foot deep ravine in Mexico, why police say the driver lost control. Plus, an American-born player playing for a different country in the Women's World Cup. I'll tell you why and which team. Coming up. So tonight, some newly released body cam footage from the L.A. County Sheriff's Department is creating some outrage over the force that deputies used to detain a couple with an investigation now in place. We're going to show you some of the video that sparked all of this, but we want to warn you, it can be hard to watch. Look at this. You can see here, the woman is taking video of what's happening on her phone when the deputies grab her. You're going to see in the next clip here, at one point, they're going to hold her down. Or even going to spray her with pepper spray. You'll see that in a second. The sheriff's department is looking into the two deputies and their use of force. Those deputies are off field duty during this investigation. Police have been responding to reports of an alleged robbery. The L.A. County Sheriff's Department says the couple matched the description given by store security and calls to 911, but they haven't released details about what the descriptions were in the call. Steve Patterson is joining us now. Explain what happened here and what happened in the moments before that video started rolling, if we know. Yeah. Yeah, Hallie, uh, first of all, uh, I mentioned we were going to have some new information the, the last time we spoke. We do have a little bit, although the details will follow. We're hearing now that the sheriff will speak in about a half hour from now. So ah, a lot of okay. these questions that you're asking me that we've been digging for, we should learn. One of those questions is, of course, what happened leading up to this? There was a burglary. And remember that a burglary is different from shoplifting. Generally, it means there was some bodily threat to the people inside this grocery store. Of course, we should know more about that. Also, what happened after these people were detained? Were they arrested? Were they cited and let go? We simply don't know that, but we should know a little bit more uh, later 
later on in about a half hour or so when the sheriff actually speaks to all of this stuff. Meanwhile, we can sort of talk about what happened. Uh, June 24th is when this all went down. Police get this call. It's a burglary in process. They find these two people. These two people, as you mentioned, match the description of the security guards inside. And then it's that violent detention of both of them. It is a bit unusual that the sheriff's department would release video of this style so soon after. It, it seems like it's been a few weeks, but th that's actually a pretty short window. So it, it may rely on something, you know, in confidence that they have some knowledge that they may have that we may learn more about. Uh, but also alongside that, they said they want to be really transparent about this case. In fact, the sheriff released a statement alongside of this. Uh, he basically said, you know, while the department doesn't make any statement related to ongoing investigation, the sheriff has made it clear he expects department personnel to treat all members of the public with dignity and respect, and that personnel who do not uphold our training standards will be held accountable. Again, this is under investigation. Those two deputies are off the street pending that investigation. We're going to learn a whole lot more in about a half hour when the sheriff speaks. And there have been planned protests. We expect another one tonight in protest of what everybody saw in that video. Callie? Looking ahead to that, Steve Patterson, thanks for being all over that story for us yep. tonight, live from L.A. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Mexican officials say at least 26 people died today after a bus lost control and fell down into a ravine, something like 75 feet. A hospital that took in victims said more than a dozen people were critically hurt. No word yet on what caused the crash. Number two, a man who confessed to raping and impregnating a nine-year-old girl in Ohio has been sentenced to life in prison today. This case got some national attention after the victim had to travel out of state to have an abortion. She was 10 years old at the time that happened. The man will be eligible for parole after serving at least 25 years and would have to register as a sex offender. Number three, former Smallville actor Allison Mack has been released from prison early, according to federal records. She pleaded guilty for her role in a sex trafficking case involving the group Nexium. Remember them? They were like a cult-like group. This was back in 2019. She was given three years in prison. At the time, prosecutors said she deserved less time behind bars because Matt cooperated. Number four, Subway, shaking things up, says it's going to install deli meat slices in 20,000 of its U.S. locations to give customers freshly cut meat, so freshly sliced meat. Before, this was all delivered to stores and pre-sliced. It's part of Subway's so-called Eat Fresh Refresh campaign, which includes a revamped menu. Number five, South Korea is including an American-born teenager in its Women's World Cup team. 16-year-old Casey Fair has a Korean mom and an American dad. And she will become the first mixed heritage player and the youngest to represent South Korea at the World Cup, men's or women's. When we come back, some breaking news coming into us. We're just getting some new video of Russian jets, Russian jets rather, harassing drones, American drones in Syria. Look at this. We'll talk about this, what else we're learning from it, what else this video shows right after the break. Plus, a new study that could have a big implication for how certain people are treated for depression and why hundreds of flights have been delayed or canceled at one of Europe's busiest airports. That's later in the local. Some groundbreaking new research shows that the depression some people get after a traumatic brain injury, like a concussion, is actually a totally different kind of depression than people who never had a brain injury at all. It's so different that they even want to give it a different name. TBI affective syndrome. That's what researchers suggest calling it. It may even need a different kind of treatment than other kinds of depression, rather than just like standard drugs. Understanding all of this is a big deal because previous research shows that people with TBI are eight times more likely to get depression and people who don't. I want to bring in now Dr. John Torres. Explain why it is such a big deal that researchers were, be able to, were, were able to tell the difference between these two types of depression in the first place and the impact that could have on patient treatment. And Hallie, there's a variety of reasons this is a big deal. One of them you alluded to, they're more likely to develop depression. But the other one is that depression doesn't respond to treatment that other types of depression do. So it's harder to treat them. On top of that, their symptoms seem to be a little bit different than with people with TBI who have depression. One of the big ones is irritability, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But the main thing is we talked to a researcher earlier today, and he said essentially what happened is they took brains of people who had TBI and suffered depression and compared them to those who had depression 
question without TBI, and they found out using artificial intelligence and looking at 200 million data points in the brain that the brain is activated in different areas when they have TBI with depression versus depression without TBI. And so they know now that it's in those different areas, they can look at targeting specific treatments to those areas to see if it can help out. Number one, because again, it's resistant to normal types of training, but also it seems, or treatment, but also it seems to be a different type of depression as well and one that definitely needs to be treated, Hallie. Is there something that people should be thinking about, right, or communicating with their doctors about if they do, let's say, get a concussion? And I don't want to, it's, it's a, a concussion is not a traumatic brain injury. Those are two separate things, right? But like repeated concussions can lead to TBI. So is there like a practical, um, like a practical thing that people should pull out of this? So one of the big things they should pull out of this is that everyone's symptoms are different and we're looking at this individualized medicine, but there are different, there are things that people should be looking at for depression in general and particularly for TBI associated depression. You can see there, the big ones are insomnia, that anxiety, that feels, feeling of worthless, worthlessness, that irritability seems to be the ones that are associated with TBI type depression. And so again, these are things to look for. If you notice these, then definitely talk to your doctor about them, Hallie. Dr. John Torres, important info. Thank you very much. You bet. Coming up, back to that breaking news as we're just getting this video in of apparently Russian jets harassing American drones in Syria. We'll have more on that, plus more on Japan set to release tons of radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean. Why a UN watchdog signed off on it, even with some experts divided. Plus, officials in China warning of multiple natural disasters this month. We'll explain why. More and more questions tonight about where the man who led the rebellion on Russia actually is right now. We're talking about the head of the Wagner Group, this guy, Evgeny Prigozhin. He's said to be in Belarus. He was apparently exiled there, but he hasn't actually been seen publicly since he led that revolt, that march on Moscow nearly two weeks ago. It comes as we're just getting in some new video from a Russian news outlet, Izvestia, that appears to show Russian police searching Prigozhin's home. They claim to have found weapons, some passports, some wigs. This is the video here. Some gold bars, some money, and various currencies. This is as today, Russian President Vladimir Putin is talking about that rebellion, saying his country is more united than ever. Keir Simmons has made his way to Belarus, and he's joining us tonight. Do we even know where Yevgeny Prigozhin is tonight, Keir? And explain why that matters when it comes to sort of the international stakes of things. We don't know, Ali, honestly. Uh, this is the first time that international journalists have been in uh, Belarus uh, since that whole rebellion and then not rebellion kind of escapade, if you like, with Wagner forces run by Pogosian heading up the freeway towards Moscow since that happened just under uh, two weeks ago. It's about 62 miles from here to the place where it's reported that there are now Wagner uh, camps uh, set up, though that hasn't been confirmed by NBC uh, News. Meanwhile, Pogosian Pogosian's plane has been seen on flight tracker moving around, zigzagging between Belarus and Russia. Again, that's not being confirmed by NBC News. And of course, it couldn't be because you don't know who's uh, on uh, that plane. We have heard from him in two audio messages, one cryptically suggesting that Wagner fighters at some point will win more victories in Ukraine. We don't know what that means. So it is something of a mystery. On the one hand, we've seen President Putin kind of, you know, put, putting out his power, if you like, showing his power on, on, on the television uh, with various uh, chances to, to meet his people and all that kind of thing. And then we haven't really seen uh, Prigozhin uh, at all. Why it matters? Well, you know, we got here just today, Hali. It, it seems like a pretty relaxed place, um, a country that still has the KGB. We walk straight through uh, immigration. Uh, but when we talk, spoke to people today a little bit, it is clear that they are anxious, uh, many uh, suggesting they don't really like the idea of Wagner being here. And that's maybe not a surprise, given uh, that they've already uh, led one rebellion uh, in Russia, right. this mercenary group. What about what we're hearing from Vladimir Putin in the last 12, 18 hours or so? Is any of that um, adding relevancy to this moment in Belarus? 
Well, we haven't really heard him do more uh, than he did appear with international leaders in the past 48 hours, saying, uh, thanking them for their support. We haven't really heard him do more of, kind of the detail, uh, if you like. Uh, and so, no, he, he hasn't really shed light on it. But, but here's an interesting point uh, about uh, all this. Uh, we haven't also heard from uh, General Saravikin, who uh, there are mm. reports may have known a little bit about this rebellion. So the question here is, uh, will President Putin uh, clamp down on those he thinks may have been involved, whoever they might be, or will he not? Uh, and if it's the latter case, will that show weakness uh, in the eyes of people around him? But if it's the, if it's the former case, uh, will that actually make things worse? I mean, th that's why it's a real challenge for President Putin. I should say, there's no sign that this is impacting the front lines in Ukraine. So, I mean, there are many questions here, inevitably, and it is, mm -hmm. once again, always challenging to figure out what happens next and what the future looks like. Kier Simmons, live for us in Belarus. I'm sure we'll be checking back in with you, Kier, in the days to come. Really appreciate you being there. Let's bring you some breaking international news here that we told you about a second ago. Look at this. This is newly released video showing what appears to be a Russian military plane engaging in what the American military says is unsafe and unprofessional behavior today over Syria. This is what they're talking about here. Three Russian fighter jets harassing a group of American drones. U.S. officials tell NBC News the jets got way too close, dropping flares. One Russian pilot even used what's called an afterburner, that really hot flame that comes out the back of a fighter, positioning it right up against one of those drones, making it harder for the drone operator to actually safely control it. You can see some of this here. I want to get right to Courtney QB, who had this story for us. She's covering all of it. What is going on in this video? How dangerous is it? What does it mean for, like, the geopolitical order court? And fill us in. So this is by far not the first time that we've seen Russian aircraft harassing U.S. military aircraft over the skies of Syria or in other areas. But the reason that this one is significant, Hallie, is because of two things. Dropping the parachute flares, which you saw a little bit of the video there that you just showed, that has the potential to impact where those MQ-9s, those drones are flying, potentially striking one causing it to crash or causing it to have to be downed. But in addition to that, the afterburner. So what that does is, as you mentioned, it's it's this, this super hot flame or flares that come out of the back of the aircraft. When they do that, it obstructs the ability for the pilot on the ground to see where he or she is going while they're flying. So in both cases, this has a real potential to cause these aircraft to to crash or even to collide into something into something else, potentially even, frankly, to those Russian fighter jets that were right. up there. So it's a very dangerous situation over the skies of Syria today, Hallie. What have the comms been between the U.S., if any, and Russia on this front regarding this? So that's it, that's one of the most interesting parts about this, frankly, is while there have been really difficult communications between the U.S. and Russia in general, even in, in, in between the U.S. military and the Russian military, one place that has maintained is what the U.S. calls the deconfliction line over Syria. That essentially is two colonels, a Russian and, an, and a U.S. colonel, on either end of a phone that whenever there's the potential that they might have aircraft or troops that are operating in close proximity, they call one another and to make sure that, that there isn't some sort of a, a, a conflict or potentially some sort of a, an accident that occurs. So it's one place where the communications have maintained over the last several years, but we still see incidents like this occurring, Hallie. Courtney Cuby, live for us at the Pentagon with that. Court, thanks for being on top of all of it, as you always are. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of other international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here are some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of China, a whole lot of rain has turned deadly now. Fifteen people have been killed in a southwestern city, according to local media. You can see some of the impact here. Terrible mudslides, really intense flooding. Thousands of people had to evacuate. The Chinese president says more has to be done to protect people from this kind of extreme weather. The Netherlands also dealing with some dangerous weather, a rare and powerful summer storm that killed at least two people there. Wind in some spots was like 90 miles an hour. Looked, it knocked down some trees. It hit some kite surfers on a beach. They shot some of it on their phone. They recorded some of it. Hundreds of flights were canceled or delayed at Amsterdam's big international airport. It's one of the busiest airports in Europe. And out of the UK, Scotland held its own coronation for King Charles III today, two months after he was crowned in London. Yes, of course, there were bagpipes. 
the king was presented with the honors of Scotland. Some people protested with signs saying, not my king. Coming up here on the show, some new conservative backlash tonight against a really popular company. Why a Ben and Jerry's tweet has some melting down. So tonight, Japan is moving forward with its plan to release more than a million tons of radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean, even though there's been some pushback from the countries around Japan. Here's the deal. This UN nuclear watchdog agency gave the green light to this plan. It said it meets safety standards. It says there is only a negligible radiological impact, their words, on people and the environment from dumping this, like, you know, water into the ocean. Why is it happening? It's because of that devastating 2011 earthquake and tsunami that damaged the Fukushima nuclear power plant. Japan kept using water to try to cool the reactors at that plant. Well, now it's left with the equivalent of like 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water, water that is contaminated, of course, from being used to cool those nuclear reactors. The plan is to dump it into the ocean, but a lot of people are a little worried about what kind of an impact that is actually going to have. Let's bring in Josh Letterman. Josh, what kind of an impact is that actually going to have? Well, authorities say it will have no impact. That's why they say it's actually safe to do this over the next 30 plus years, Hallie. But the $30,000 word to know here is tritium. That is the name of this radioactive version of hydrogen that they can't seem to be able to get out of this wastewater because all of the other dangerous bad stuff that is in that water that has been contaminated by being used to cool uh, the nuclear reactor at Fukushima for the last decade plus all the rest of that they can get rid of using advanced uh, processing and filtration. But this tritium is the big problem. It's a naturally occurring substance. It's already in the water. It's actually already in the human body. And at low levels, it's perfectly safe. But it is present in that wastewater that they plan to be releasing uh, into the ocean. And that's why there's all kinds of consternation from China to South Korea, other nations that do not want to see any levels of radioactive substances dumped in, in by mass, massive amounts, 500 swimming pools worth uh, into the ocean. That, that's the skepticism. That's the deal. What is the process for treating this, right? Like, in other words, what, what does this water have to go through? What, what has happened um, as it relates to this sort of radioactive, you know, contaminated waste now that's getting that, that Japan's getting rid of? Right. So as they have been pumping this water into the nuclear reactor to cool it, uh, they have been putting it through uh, an advanced filtration process. It's called uh, liquid processing. And they are able to then take out most of the other radioactive stuff before it gets into uh, these 1,000 plus holding tanks that they have been building for a decade now. They don't have any more room for more tanks. And so they want to take that water that is currently in those holding tanks and they're going to dump it into the the ocean. But first, they're going to dilute it to bring down the levels of tritium down low enough that it'll be safe for human consumption, Hallie. Josh, Letterman live for us on that. Uh, Josh, thank you very much. In other international news, it's also domestic. Thousands of miles from the Ukrainian front lines, there's a Pennsylvania plant providing key support in the fight against Russia. This factory is running almost around the clock to produce thousands of rounds of shells every month. NBC's Jesse Kirsch has more. In the middle of its bloody offensive, Ukraine's success relies in part on a very different front line. This one, more than 5,000 miles away, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We are producing, you know, thousands of rounds more a month than we were this time last year. Inside this U.S. Army ammunition plant, contractor General Dynamics produces 155-millimeter artillery shells. Eventually becoming some of the very firepower crucial to Ukraine's fight against Russia. In late May, NBC News was granted access to the plant, one of the locations helping make 24,000 rounds each month. I can feel that heat from back here. The Army says this is a 2,000-degree furnace, essentially turning steel into Play-Doh. American steel sculpted, inspected, and sent off to be armed with explosives. Part of what the Pentagon says is an urgent ramp-up. The Army won't tell us exactly how many are going to Ukraine. The Army says that's because of security concerns. But even if every one of these shells went to Ukraine, that may still not be enough. 
Some in the Scranton community grateful for the city's role in the Ukrainian war effort. The pride is just huge. Yeah, I think Ukraine should get as much ammunition as they can. But figuring out how to send so much firepower to Ukraine also raises concerns about America running out of ammunition. Seth Jones studies military operations. If the United States went to war today, would this country be ready for the fight? The United States went to war today. It would have enough weapons in some cases for a short war. Uh, it would not have sufficient weapons and munitions for a protracted war. And that is the problem. The Pentagon told NBC News it was meeting the needs of Ukrainian forces while ensuring our inventories are replenished. But amid tensions with Russia and China, the Army says right now it's experiencing its fastest conventional ammunition ramp up since the Korean War. A race to help those on the battlefield today and possibly tomorrow. Jesse Kirsch, NBC News, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Our thanks to Jesse for that. For that, that does it for this hour. Top Story picks up coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.